Let's read the opening verses of Hebrews. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. A friend of mine was in Scotland two weeks ago. He was speaking at a conference of uh, Christians there, and he and his wife got on the train to come back to Manchester. And um, a young couple came in, and uh, they sat uh, next to them, opposite them. And they started to talk to them. Um, Where have you been? And they said, oh, we've been um, up in Scotland, uh, here in Scotland. We've been uh, speaking at a, a, a conference of Christians. Oh, oh, you were speaking at a conference of Christians. Oh, <laughs> Um, so you are you a minister? Yes, he said. Um, but you're not wearing a collar. I'm a hairdresser, and uh, uh, when ministers come in uh, to get their hair cut, they, they even there they wear a collar. You know, yes, we we don't all wear collars, he said. And then he had a book there that he was reading, and the word evangelical was um, on the cover. And she said, oh, evangelical, uh, what does that mean? I, d I don't understand it. And she's, he said, well, evangel means good news. It's good news about Jesus Christ. You know, I don't know a thing about Jesus Christ, she said. I don't know anything at all. Do you know about him? And he said, yes, that's, that's been what my, my life has been the last uh, 30 years. I've been telling people about Jesus Christ. And she asked him questions. It was a most extraordinary and wonderful privilege to share with a person like that about Jesus Christ. She didn't know anything about him. And I want to do that very thing. We should always be doing it, of course. But I want to do it tonight, and I want to do it from this passage in the letter to the Hebrews. I want to tell you about the greatness of Jesus Christ. Now, there are various kinds of greatness, aren't there? There's relative greatness and there's absolute greatness. Uh, Mount Snowdon, not far away in uh, Snowdonia in North Wales, it's the highest mountain in England and Wales. It's uh, a great mountain. But that's relatively great if you put it down in the Alps, comparing it to Mont Blanc, it would be um, a hill. Or if you put it in the Himalayas, and compared it to Everest, it would, it would simply be a molehill. That's relative greatness. There's a mayor in Aberystwyth, but he's not very well known in Manchester. Or compared to the mayor of New York, that's relative greatness. But Jesus Christ isn't relatively great. He's absolutely great. He's magnificently great. He's uniquely great. And what I've done now in finding some comparisons to illustrate to you his unique greatness, the writer to the Hebrews does in this opening chapter of the letter to the Hebrews. And he ends in chapter 2 verse 3 by saying, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? And our salvation is so great because our Saviour is so great. Well, in what ways is he great? How is he absolutely great? Well, firstly, he's great in comparison to the prophets. God, who in different ways and different times has spoken to our fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. The prophets are God's servants. Jesus Christ is God's Son. There's a great difference, isn't there, between a servant and a son? You know... Um, 
tomorrow morning, perhaps at uh, 10 o'clock, the doorbell will ring and you'll go and uh, it's a delivery man. You've ordered something and the man, he's coming. He's a servant and he brings it to you and you sign for it. And then quarter past 10, the doorbell goes again and you go and it's a, this time it's the man wanting to read the meter. And so he reads the meter and off he goes again. He's your servant. And then half past ten, the doorbell goes again. You say, well, I'm very popular this morning. And you go and open the door, and it's your son. Surprise, ma'am, he says. Uh, the firm sent me down to Manchester today, and uh, I thought I'd give you a surprise. Well, you say, you give him a big hug. Come in. You say to him, uh, tea or coffee, what do you want now? If I knew you were coming, I'd have baked a cake come in you say and so he comes in and tell me how's your wife and how are the kids and you talk and talk away and give him a big kiss when he leaves because he's your son he's not a servant and the prophets of God they were God's servants I suppose the greatest prophet would be Elijah when on the Mount of Transfiguration God brings um, the representative of the law, he brings Moses, and the representative of the prophets, he brings Elijah to talk to Jesus. And Elijah was a great man. He had a wonderful triumph on Mount Carmel, and they destroyed the prophets of Baal there. But uh, their leader, Queen Jezebel, said, I'll get you. I'll get you. I'll separate your breath from your body. Or words to that effect, she said to Elijah and he ran away and he ran for several days out of the land of promise and into the wilderness he went until he collapsed in exhaustion under a juniper tree and he said now Lord take away my life I, I'm no better than my father's and the Lord came to him and said to him what are you doing here Elijah and challenged him now Jesus Christ was threatened more than by a woman he was threatened by Caiaphas and Annas the high priests the Sanhedrin Herod Pilate the Pharisees they were all against him he never ran away he turned his face steadfastly to Jerusalem he went there to the terrible death that awaited him our Lord Jesus is greater than the greatest prophet, Elijah. Or if you ask who's the greatest writing prophet, you would say, oh, well, Isaiah is the greatest writing prophet. The great chapter 53 of Isaiah, which speaks of his death. Uh, the uh, great chapters in the early ch w bar parts of the writings of Isaiah where he speaks about a virgin conceiving and bearing a son and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And yet when Elijah saw the Lord in the temple high and lifted up, he collapsed in fear and awe before him. Woe is me, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the king, he said. Jesus never said, woe is me. Jesus never said, I'm undone. He said, I always say what my father says. I always do what my father does. I and my father are one, he said. Jesus, greater than the prophets. Or, um, Jesus says the greatest of the prophets is John the Baptist. And none born of woman as great as he. And yet when John the Baptist saw him, John said, I must decrease and he must increase. I, I'm unworthy to undo the lace of his garments. Jesus, greater then than all the prophets. So Jesus, absolutely great. Prophets came with the word of God. Holy men of old were moved by the spirit of God. They brought the very message of God to us. Jesus, the Son of God, speaking then, thus saith the Lord. 
So that's the first comparison. Jesus great in comparison to the prophets. And then secondly, Jesus greater than the angels. And all the rest of the first chapter is concerned with how much greater Jesus is than the angels. The angels are great. Oh, they were uh, mighty in their power. One angel could kill the whole Assyrian army. Um, when John saw an angel, one angel, in uh, the book of Revelation, the, uh, he just fell before him. Uh, and the angel had to say, don't worship me, worship God. The One angel, let alone an innumerable company of them, how glorious they are. But Jesus is their Lord. Jesus designed them, thought of them, created them. And they uh, stand before the Lord on his throne every day and they receive his, uh, his bidding. They say, t she, he says to one angel, um, bring a man safely from London to Manchester to speak. Bring the congregation to hear him and look after them and care for them. And the angel immediately does that and shepherds us and brings us together like this. Uh, angels are great. They fly across land and sea to do the bidding of the Lord. Um, but Jesus is greater than them because Jesus made them and Jesus judges them. And to Jesus they answer and they're... The sound of their voices to one another is about Jesus. Holy, holy, holy. Isn't he holy? He's so great. He's so glorious. And so uh, here is just not super men, but here is super humanness in angels. And Jesus great. Jesus great in, in, in making them all. And so Jesus is great in comparison to prophets and he's great in comparison to to angels you know there's a, a cult of worshipping angels and uh, in a little town in Pembrokeshire I have a minister friend and uh, there's a group of women and they meet together to worship the angels and the leader bumped into uh, my friend on the pavement there one day and uh, he said to her, how are you? And she, she said, oh, I'm, I'm just very well. Oh, yes. Um, and, you know, we're having wonderful meetings. Do you know the angel Gabriel has been to see us? She said, oh, has he been to see you? Oh, yes. She says, do you know how you can tell if an angel has been to visit you? No. What am I telling you? She said, you know everything about the Bible. No, I don't know everything. He said, do you know how you can tell if an angel has been to see you? She said, no, I don't know. They always leave a white feather behind, she said. <laughs> what if it's a black feather? He said, oh, we don't want one of those angels visiting us. <laughs> you can just see the scene, can't you? She's there with her lady friends, simple people. And at the end she says, now ladies, let's pray together. Close your eyes. And when they close... She brings out a white feather and she puts it down, doesn't she? An angel has been to see us. The old folk religions, with the decline of Christianity, the vacuum is filled with silly superstitions like that. Angels are with us now. We can't see them, but we know that they are always with worshipping people because where their Lord is, there they are doing his bidding but Jesus greater than them all thirdly Jesus is greater than the creation we're told in those opening verses of Hebrews by Jesus God made the worlds God made the worlds through Jesus Christ now you know we can divide the Godhead into the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit and we say the Father created all things and the Son redeemed us and the Spirit regenerated us, gave us life and knowledge and understanding. And we have that threefold division and it's very useful and it's all true. But it's not a rigid division because God made all things through Jesus Christ. Uh, John's Gospel begins by telling us that. 
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Everything, the beautiful mountains of Wales, were made by my Saviour, Jesus Christ. And so there can be nothing in, in creation, there can be nothing that's hostile or contradictory to Jesus Christ. There can't be. It's immensely significant. I see all my environment when I see some of the nature films on television. My Saviour designed and made those fish and those birds and those animals. Uh, all things bright and beautiful. The Lord God, Jesus Christ, made them all. Um, Jesus is wisdom. Jesus is power. Jesus is grace. And he made the world. And so there'll be no, nothing at variance with Jesus Christ. So you can come to a university in London or in, to Aberystwyth or Manchester and you can study biology and zoology and geology and archaeology and all the ologies that there are. And you will find nothing in them that can contradict what the Bible says, where this world came from. Now there'll be lecturers who will twist and turn and use their authority as your teachers to uh, seek to undermine your trust in the Bible. But in the creation itself, there'll be nothing that contradicts the reality of God's power in Christ in making the world. And our children go off at 11, they go to the big school, and they come home at the end of the first day with a bag, a satchel. Oh, ma'am, all the books we've got. Oh, ma'am. And they show us this book, ma'am. Mathematics. This book, ma'am. Chemistry. This book, ma'am. Physics. Oh, ma'am. It's going to be hard in school. And then you encourage them, don't you? And we say to them that these books are describing the thought patterns of Jesus Christ as we understand them now in 2018 how he devised the world how he designed the atom how he devised the galaxy how he devised boiling point and gravity and pi and Jesus made all the world and so it's charged with his grandeur um, and when we know he made it, it's not less awesome or less mysterious or less beautiful because we know he made it. We don't worship. We don't worship trees and fish and crocodiles and cows. We don't worship them. We worship the one who made them. And so um, Christ is great then in comparison, firstly, with prophets, secondly, with angels, thirdly, with the cosmos. Fourthly, Christ is great in relation to God. And this is what I've just read to you in the opening verses of, of Hebrews. Um, we're told he is the brightness of God's glory and he is the express image of his person. That's what we're told in verse 3 there, aren't we? That's his relationship to God. He is the brightness of God's glory. It is not that God is glorious and then Jesus, a little candle flame flickering away in this world. He is the brightness of God's glory. When, uh, when he raised Lazarus from the dead or the widow of Nain's son from the dead or Jairus' daughter when he healed the leper and gave sight to somebody born blind and healed the paralytic, he was the brightness of God's glory in his power. Uh, when he turned water into wine and spoke to the winds and waves and they obeyed him, there's the brightness of God's glory. When on the cross he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. There was nothing more glorious 
that Jesus ever did than to say those words. Uh, There's no more loving example of the love of God than when Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He's the brightness. God is glorious. But if you want to see how glorious he is, you must look at Jesus Christ. I and my Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, he says. He's the brightness of God's glory and he's the express image. He he is the express image of the identical image of God. He's, He's identical. You remember in the office when finally, after months of grumbling, they delivered a new photocopying machine and they brought it in on two engineers and they wheeled it in and they put it down and then they unscrewed it and set it all up and plugged it in and then it hummed and they, then they got a piece of paper with a, a very elaborate pattern and they put it down and pressed the button and two seconds and out came a copy and they brought out the original. Now they said which is the original and which is the copy? Come and, come and examine. You tell us which is, which is the image and which is the original. And you look and look. Well, if you've got a magnifying glass, you could probably tell after a while which was. But there's no magnifying glass that can distinguish the being of God the Son from God the Father. He's the express image, the express likeness. If you've seen me, you have seen the Father. Jesus says, Ham. This is the wonder of John's Gospel, isn't it? And the opening words. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There is in God withness. So that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God, and these three are one God. Um, The church the early church, it, the best minds in the world for the first three or four centuries, they discussed this and they wrote it out finally in a place called Chalcedon and they expressed beautifully there that uh, there, there is simply one God. There are not three clouds in heaven, there's one cloud, one being. One usios was the word and they um, spoke of the Jesus as um, homo usios. Homo means the same. Usios is the being, the essence. And Jesus is the same essence as God the Father. A different person. He's not the Father. He's the Son. The Father sent him. He alone came. The Father didn't die on the cross. Only Jesus. So there are different persons in the Godhead, but there is one being in God. He is the same. He's not less than God the Father at all. He's not inferior to God the Father at all. He's a a distinct person and God the Father loves him and God the Father commissions him and gives him strength to do everything, answers all his prayers. Uh, But the man Christ Jesus, the God-man, is the same in power and glory as God the Father. Uh, the same name, the same eminence, the same status. He is Jehovah Jesus. And he is equal to God the Father. The most basic thing about us when we meet is that we worship Jesus Christ. The most basic thing is that we sing praise to Jesus Christ. There was a, a an emperor in the early days of the church and he was troubled about all that he heard about this new cult that was spreading like wildfire in which, what did they do? They ate the body and they drank the blood? Were they cannibals? And he sent a proconsul to one of the meetings. He slipped in incognito and he looked and he listened and he wrote a report uh, pacifying the emperor And this is what he said. These people, they meet early in the morning and they sing hymns to Christ as to a God. And that's what we did when we gathered this morning and when we gathered again 
we, we sang the praises of Jesus Christ. Oh, for a thousand tongues, we wish we were a thousand who were gathered here and that we were all singing the praises of Jesus. We were worshipping and praising Jesus. And if, he, if he's not God, that would be a blasphemous thing for us to do. But we believe that he is co-eternal with God. He is co-equal with God. He is co-substantial. He's the same substance, the same cloud as God. Uh, we believe in the deity, in the Godhead of the Son of God. And that's what being a Christian is. Do you know, a Christian is someone who worships Jesus Christ. And that practice requires vindication. And the vindication is here in the opening words of Hebrews. Uh, that tell us how great Jesus is in comparison to God. He's at the right hand of God. He does all the functions of God. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got you. Your breath is in his hands. The electrical activity in your brain is all manufactured and sustained by the great electrician in heaven, by the Lord Jesus Christ and so um, the, God is upholding us and keeping us. All the way my Savior leads me, we say. He's led me all the way. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd and he leads me by still waters and by green pastures and he meets all my needs. And behind all the movements of history, behind Brexit then, we see the hand of Jesus somewhere in it all and the fact that you are here tonight that you're not in prison you're not in the gutter you're not uh, p plotting murder but you're here to know more of Jesus Christ that's because he's led you he's led you to this very moment how much you are in debt to Jesus Christ so I have told you four things about Jesus Christ I wanted to show you how great he is, that he is great in comparison to the prophets, great in relation to the angels, great in relationship to the universe, great in relationship to God. And I have built up for you a picture of a magnificent saviour, of his grandeur and his awesomeness and his very essence and otherness. And there's a gulf. An impassable gulf between him and shrimps like ourselves. I've given you an almost unreachable and unattainable saviour. And that's where the danger lies. That uh, we lose contact with him because he is so exalted and divine. He is the creator and we are specks of dust that fly on, on his eternal vision. And we feel there's no continuity between him and us. Um, he's too remote, he's too incomprehensible for us to understand and sympathize. How can he speak to little people like ourselves? And that's happened in Christian history. It happened as they just said how magnificent and glorious Jesus was. And that was their one great theme. And people were in trouble and people had heartaches and awesome needs. And so the church said to them, Oh, speak to his mother. His mother is so tender. His mother is so compassionate. His mother is so lovely. She'll put in a word for you. Say, um, Holy Mary, Mother of God, have pity on us. Sinners, now and in our hour of need. And pray to Mary, they said. And so they constructed this female goddess figure. But my friends, uh, we're told about Jesus Christ, not in this first chapter, but at the end of chapter 4. Familiar words. We have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but one who is tempted in all points as we are and yet without sin. You see the double negative, two negatives make a positive, don't they? 
So when he says, we do not have a high priest who cannot be touched, we have a high priest who can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. When you find the lump and go to the doctor and he says, I think we'll have to remove it. And you feel, oh boy. And Jesus feels not just for you, but with you. There's an empathy between this great Savior and ourselves. He sympathizes with us and he sends relief to us. Um, the one who is the brightness of God's glory and the express image of his person. Um, because, you see, he's taken our nature. He's born and developed in the womb of the Virgin and grew up in a home and was nursed and breastfed and his uh, nappies were changed by his mother and he's seen half-sisters and brothers born and he's lived, shared a bedroom with his brothers and that's our saviour, Jesus Christ. He's come into our weakness. He's pitched his tent in the valley of the shadow. He's come where men crucify other men. He's come where they throw a woman at his feet and pick up jagged rocks to smash her face in and break her breastbone and kill her by stoning. And Jesus is there. He's seen this wicked world. He knows all about it. He has a human body. He has a human anatomy and human psychology and a human nervous system and a human sensitivity to pain. There was no divine analgesic uh, painkiller that God built into the body of Jesus so that he didn't feel pain. There was no such thing. He has human affections and human emotions and human decisions. And he's taken our human nature in a tested fallen world. Not like Adam in a perfect world but in a groaning world, in a world where the God of this world reigns, where you have full frontal confrontation with Satan who says, do this and I'll give you everything. And he came. Our Lord knew physical pain. Our Lord knew emotional pain. When his family didn't understand him, when his disciples uh, ran away and left him all alone, he knew the pain of loneliness and the pain of fear and the pain of longing that the cup could be different from the cup that he'd been given to drink. He knew spiritual pain about being forsaken by God. He knew that. He knew what it was like to cry, my God, my God, why? And God not telling him why. He's been there. He's been in the dust. He's been in the tomb. And that's uh, the great symbol of his compassion, that he became one with us. He tasted the same death that we are all going to taste one day. There's a great verse in Psalm 103 which tells us he remembers that we are dust. It's not that he knows it because he's omniscient and knows everything. But he remembers it because he's been dust He's been in a time of temptation and anguish and sorrow and spiritual darkness. He's been in circumstances where he felt he couldn't cope. Is there another, another cup I can drink? Uh, he, when he felt helpless and God wasn't there. And you know, he doesn't forget things as we do. There are no memory cells that die in the mind of Jesus. He remembers as vividly as it was 2,000 years ago when he was whipped and when they smashed their fist into his blindfolded face and asked him to prophesy. He remembers all that when he was so weak from a, a loss of blood that he collapsed and someone else had to carry his cross. He remembers, he remembers all of that 
when he cried, Why? I don't understand what's going on. Why hast thou forsaken me? And so when he sees you in your struggles, and when he sees you in your physical pain and emotional pain and social pain and loneliness, his heart beats for you and with you in sympathy. And he turns to his father and he says, Father, there's this woman in Manchester and she's going through a very difficult time just now. Send the Spirit into her life in a new way to strengthen her and comfort her and help her to get through this winter. And he prays for you in this way. Amen. There's many a human being who is saying why. Many Christians in gospel churches tonight are saying, I wonder why this has happened to me. I wonder why I became a widow so young. I wonder why I had a handicapped child. I wonder why I, I'm in such pain all the time and there's no cure for me. And there's no one can tell you the answer to those questions. They are secret things known to God. But you'll know one day. Uh, heaven won't be a place of eternal mystery and uncertainty. Um, we'll know face to face in those days. He'll tell us to our total satisfaction. when you say no one understands there's somebody who understands and uh, you have access to him 24 hours a day you can speak to him and there's no physical pain he's a stranger to no satanic pain that he's a stranger to no spiritual darkness and that's why Jesus Christ is so great great in comparison to prophets, great in comparison to angels, great in comparison to creation, great in comparison to God himself, but oh, great in, in his sympathy, in his compassion, in his tenderness. And that's why he's so, he is so great. So some of you who are like the woman speaking to my friend a couple of weeks ago and, and saying to him, I don't know anything about Jesus. You've been brought here tonight by angels that you could safely come here. And he's brought me here to tell you these things that you might yourself understand more of Jesus and why you need him, why you desperately need him. Uh, I can't understand how anyone can come here and hear about Jesus Christ and go away as cold and as indifferent as when they came. And if you've heard me tonight and your response is, yes, but would you say that? Would you dare to say that? about Jesus knowing how weak you are knowing what demands are going to be made upon you in the next months and here is a saviour who is willing to be your own personal lord and saviour and you say yes but would you dare say that how can you say that Every mouth stopped. And when God gives us permission to speak, all we can say is, I, I wish it wasn't me. Have mercy on me, Lord. Have mercy on me. Make Jesus Christ my Savior. Give me this shepherd, this king, this teacher, this compassionate friend that I can have him tonight and all my days and be with him forever and anticipate seeing him seeing his face how wonderful Jesus is and he's here tonight and he's told you about himself in order for you to respond in wonder and in thanksgiving and in a life of serving him it's the happiest life it's the most wonderful life to know Jesus Christ 
to know that he's working all things together for your good nothing's ever going to separate you from his love that he's going to supply all your needs richly that he's going to make all grace always abound whatever the circumstances however great the cross that you are carrying he'll help you this Jesus will that, that's why he's brought you here to offer this to you. you you take him now it's a movement of the Holy Spirit as he takes the word that you've heard about Jesus and applies it to you personally that you may say my Lord and my God my Lord my Savior my wonderful Savior. Amen. Let's pray together. We pray, Heavenly Father, now that you will send your Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus Christ, upon all of us here, that people here may tonight know that they need Jesus and that he's willing to forgive them for whatever they've done and become their Lord and Savior for the rest of their lives and that they will receive him. And as many as received him to them, he gave the right to be called the children of God, the sons of God. Add to your family, precious Saviour, and give yourself glory by doing so. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.